Hey, my name is Bryce and welcome back to my YouTube channel, Jacko Trades. We're just getting into week three of the 2024 Poor Boys RC Speedrun Challenge. Uh, working with our Tamiya MFO1X uh, chassis. We are obviously running in the open class. So just a bit of warning, this video is going to be long. So grab yourself a drink, some popcorn, sit back, relax and enjoy the show. So we're going to do a deep dive on my car, um, the setup, the radio setup. Everything that I've done to get the car to where it is now, where we came from, and where we're going. Um, and then we'll end the video with our entry for the week three speed run. Even though it's Sunday, uh, we're at the beginning of the week, I'm not going to have any time to run, especially at the spot where I like to run. Where I like to run, there's a lot of traffic during the week, kind of all times of the day. Um, so the only time I can run there is early morning on the weekends. The next time I'll be able to run will be uh, the next Saturday, which will be for the week uh, four run and the challenge. So... Uh, without further ado, let's get into it. I'm going to do a little bit of stuff up here and then we'll flip the camera around to the bench so we can dive even deeper into the car. Um, we just got back from our run. We set a new PB. Uh, most of you already know that because I posted it on Facebook, but if you want to see it, skip ahead to the end of the video. Um, we did end with a crash. Uh, the car was growing really nice, uh, really smooth throttle response, um, super stable, and then we hit one of those stupid little um, cat eye uh, lane divider pucks in the middle of the road and it kind of uh, tore off the front end um, or the front right corner of my car. Um, I destroyed my steering knuckle. The unfortunate thing with these cars right now is parts are in high demand and they're hard to find. I wonder why they're in high demand right now. <laughs> um, What's weird is like these red parts, this is the F parts tree I believe, on the Tamiya website they say that these are discontinued even though they're producing these kits. So that's odd to me that you have a discontinued parts tree on a, a kit that's in production. Um, and it's annoying because you can't find these in the states. They are only available overseas. Um, and that parts tree is basically all the red parts in the kit. So the front steering, uh, the front C hubs, the steering knuckles, and then the rear uprights. On my car, it looks like I only damaged my steering knuckle. A couple of people have commented on Facebook that you can replace these front bits with the um, the TL01. I guess they're drop-in. Um, I don't have any TL01 parts, but I do have TRF418 parts coming from my TTO2 SRX kit. Um, and what I discovered is that the steering knuckle is almost a drop-in replacement um, from that uh, TRF418 kit. Those are carbon reinforced parts. So that's kind of nice, but at 100 miles an hour, it probably doesn't matter if they're carbon reinforced. You're going to break something in a crash. But they, and they'll need a couple of shims on top and bottom because uh, so, they are a little bit looser. They're, they're meant to have these bushings that insert from the uh, inside of the C-Hub. And then that kind of uh, takes up that gap. Um, but those bushings are too small for these C-hubs, um, so you'll have to use washers if you want to use those steering knuckles. For the C-hubs, I don't really have a good replacement. I guess, that we, again, you could look at the TLO ones, uh, but I don't, I don't have those, so I, I can't really confirm that, but it has been confirmed by other people on the Facebook group. So I'm still running the Tamiya Ford uh, GT Mark II body. Um, I did go ahead and implement my own um, wing and fins. Uh, I had the original one that I ran and it actually got me my, my, one of my PVs at 91 miles an hour. Um, but it was very fragile and I ended up destroying it. And so I wanted something that was a little more purpose built, um, where I had better control of the angle attack of the wing. And then I had kind of a more integrated solution for the fins. <clears throat> now I am a huge fan of hot gluing things. Uh, the hot glue tends to bond pretty well to the body parts. Um, and it just works and then uh, as the glue kind of cools off you can form it with your finger to get nice smooth fillets in the corners. My background isn't in aerospace. I, I, I'm not that good with aerodynamics but I understand some of the fundamentals. Um, I've done soapbox racing in the past. I've, I've made winning soapbox cars um, where aerodynamics is, is critical. Um, and so I, I kind of understand some of the basic rules, aerodynamics. Um, one of the things with wings is that they add drag, and that drag creates a moment about the rear wheels, 
where if your wing is too high up or too far back, uh, what it can do is it can actually cause you to lose traction in the front end. It'll pull, it'll help, it'll want to help pull up that front end, um, which can cause you to go airborne. Um, and I think that's what happened on the uh, the run where I destroyed the wing. I was trying to, you know, going for 100 miles an hour. Um, this has a really sharp um, angle of attack here. And I think that kind of caused the car to flip up because um, it was too much drag. It caused the front end to flip up and the car went airborne. Um, so I wanted a wing where I could adjust the angle and it was kind of integrated into the design. Uh, with this design I've got these slots on the side so I can loosen these screws and change that angle of attack on that wing. Right now I'm kind of at the mid attack which is around 12 degrees. Um, but I can go all the way up to 25 degrees if I wanted to. Right now it's actually running really nice so I don't have to do anything. You know, I just had this crash at a very high speed uh, and the body is held up quite well. Um, I do get some road rash on these wings, but you can uh, go back and kind of glue that up with CA glue for the thin stuff. It wicks in as the carbon fiber delaminates, uh, the CA glue will wick into those layers and kind of uh, rebond it and solidify it again. I do that a lot with the, the pan, the carbon fiber pan. I get kind of delamination around the edges, but I just go back in there with um, some CA glue and rebond that and it stiffens it back up and I'm good for another run. Some other changes that I did since my 91 mile an hour pass, um, I went ahead and upgraded to the larger 1412 6400 kV motor. Um, I'm now running mod 0.8 gears for my pinion spur, and then I'm running the uh, monster, the Castle Monster uh, X uh, uh, speed controller. Now, this is the exact, this is actually the setup for my TTO2 where I did 117 miles an hour. Um, so I know it works, and I went ahead and pulled that from my TTO2, and I'm running it in this car. Um, and that's just a bunch of little kind of fine details to the car. Um, in my last, in my 95 mile an hour run, I ended that with a stripped gear. So as we all know, there's these plastic shims between the bearing and the, the bevel gear on the prop shaft. And those set the gear mesh uh, between the bevel gears. So what happened on the rear is that that spacer actually melted and it, it allowed the, uh, the bevel gear to back off. So it was a really loose mesh and then that caused it to strip out. Um, I've since replaced those plastic shims with stainless steel shims. Um, and I, by using stainless shims, I'm able to really dial in uh, that mesh to exactly where I want it um, instead of relying on the, the molded plastic parts. The other thing that I've been focusing on this car is vibrations. Uh, noise and vibrations. If your car is noisy or it vibrates or you get a lot of, you know, if you put this up on a stand and you run it, you peg it out at full throttle and you feel the car vibrating, all that vibration, and if your car is noisy because your gear mesh is too tight, um, all that noise and vibration is equal to lost energy, which means you're, you're putting energy into the vibration and the noise and not into the ground uh, where it should be. So anything you can do to reduce vibrations and reduce the noise, your car should be quiet going down the street. If it's not, then um, spend a little more time kind of tuning things up and making sure it's smooth. As you, as you build your gearboxes, you know, the front and the rear, make sure they're super smooth. Um, and then as you put the car together with your prop shaft, make sure everything's still smooth. Your car should kind of just roll across the bench with very little noise. That gear noise we hear is between the, it's the cogging between the, um, the pinion and the spur. And these are steel tooth gears, so they're gonna be noisy. But this car is pretty smooth right now. Um, so pay attention to that. I'm not really a racer. I've never gotten seriously into RC car racing. I've done a little bit in the past, but I haven't done any touring car racing. It was mostly just off-road stuff. Um, so I've never trued tires. Um, and that's something that I've gotten into this year for the first time where I'm not only truing the tires, but I'm making sure that I dial in the, uh, the diameters so they're equal. And I'm also uh, balancing them. So for truing the tires, I made a mandrel for my lathe and then uh, I'm using a sanding block to uh, basically sand the tires down. Now you can buy truing bits, but they're not cheap. And so I'm just kind of going the poor boys route of using a sanding block uh, with some 80 grit sandpaper to uh, true these up. It kind of works if the wheels are already are really out. I, I can't get the hops out because as, as the wheel hops, your sanding block is hopping. So that's, I think, part of the... Um, the learning curve of how to true up tires. But it, it, again, it's just, it's it's additional detail I'm paying to the car um, to eliminate that vibration, which which should equal a little bit more power to the wheels. 
um, and, and improved traction. For balancing, I have this, um, there's lots of people that make these balancing tools. This one's by J Concepts. Basically what you do is you, um, you take your wheel and it goes kind of inside out. Um, you put that on, there's, there's adapter diameters here so that it fits, like this one fits the 12 millimeter hex. And you kind of let it float and you see um, where it stops spinning. And then you kind of just, so like this one has a, a low spot here, which means my, I want to add some weight to the top. And so what I would do is I add weight to the top until it, it gets rid of any bias that it wants to um, find that kind of low point. So I've been balancing my wheels. And then what you use to balance is you have this kind of, it's almost like a putty slash clay. Um, you just take off tiny little bits and then you shove it on the inside of the wheel and you squish it down. And then you, you get it to where it, it has no bias anymore. Um, so there you can kind of see um, that's some putty. This wheel has been pre balanced previously. Uh, it looks like it's out of balance again. <laughs> but let's get into the radio system. So last year I was running the FlySky Noble MB4 Pro. Uh, I started running into range issues where I was losing contact with the radio. It was becoming problematic to the point where I decided to go ahead and pick up a Radiolink RC6GS. Um, these are very affordable radios that have incredible range. Uh, I think partially what helps with that range is these dual antennas. If you do go with this radio system, uh, make sure you read the instructions on your antenna setup. Uh, your antennas are supposed to be 90 degrees out. So I have this little 3D printed antenna holder um, that puts these out, but they're not 90 degrees, they're maybe around 70 degrees. Uh, but for, for what I'm doing, it actually works fine, but if you want to get optimum range, they should be closer to 90, like that. Receivers are pretty affordable. The radio is affordable. Um, the receiver has a built-in gyro. I used to run external gyros and now the receiver has a built-in gyro. The nice thing about, well, those, those external gyros are actually about the same price as the receiver. So you might as well just get a receiver that comes with the built-in gyro. Um, and then you can control the gain of that gyro uh, from the radio. And I'll go over a little bit on how you set up your gyro um, to make sure that it works for you. So I got the RC6GS radio for the uh, TTO2 speedrun challenge last year. And then at the end of the year, I went ahead and upgraded to the uh, RC8X uh, radio link radio. Uh, it has a nice uh, screen on it. And then it has basically just a lot nicer user interface and a lot more options for setting up your car. So that's what we're running this year is the RC8X uh, with our uh, MFO1X car. Incidentally, uh, I might have a radio for sale. <laughs> parts are not, as you said, parts are hard to find. Uh, but I started digging into my uh, spare parts for my TTO2, uh, which we see here. <laughs> and these are basically uh, TRF418 parts, which seem to work. Uh, if I break my C-hubs, uh, I might look at using the TRF-418 C-hubs. It will require new arms, but my arms are 3D printed anyways, so that's not a big deal. Um, they do make these kind of low friction 5mm adjusters. Uh, what I've done on my car is to get rid of the slop. I did this on my TTO2 and I do it on this car. And what I do is I, I um, for all my ball joints, I have used thin CA glue and wicked it in there and let it set. And while it's setting, you want to move that joint around so it doesn't quite bond. But what that glue does is it fills in the gaps between the rod ends. Um, and it gets a little stiff, but you can kind of loosen it up uh, by working it. And using, I use a little bit of TriFlow as lubricant. And you basically work the joint uh, to free it up a little bit. It'll be stiffer than what you like. They, they don't fall under their own weight but um, it's worth the precision that you get out of the suspension. In my opinion, for me, it's worth the precision you get out of your suspension by doing that. Okay, so before we flip the camera around, uh, let's go ahead and look at our parts bin that we have. So this is my kind of walk of shame parts bin. These are all the parts that have gone into the car uh, this year. Um, I actually haven't used a lot of off-the-shelf parts. Those are the parts that I break. I've been 3D printing. I have yet, I think I've used one new set of contact wheels and all my others are leftovers from uh, last year's TTO2 run. Um, I am, uh, you know, a lot of these are kind of chunked. Um, and actually these aren't even the bad ones. I, I've thrown away the bad ones. Um, some of these are kind of what I would say too far out of balance, or not out of balance, too far out of true that I can't get them true without taking off a lot of material. Um, carbon fiber bits, 
This is chassis tree. Uh, I got a spare rear chassis set. I, I'm on my second front chassis. Um, it's seen its life to the point where I have started epoxying pivots that have sheared off. Um, what kind of did it in for me on this one was I lost one of those mounting bosses uh, that joins the two halves together. Um, there's my first pan chassis uh, with the Mamba X speed controller. Speed controller still good. I just wanted to go something with higher current, damaged wing. Um, <laughs> all sorts of parts. These are my iterations for the chassis shape. Getting that profile right, the male-female profile. Um, it took me a while to get there. Um, uh, this is kind of a one-piece print with the bearing integrated. Uh, this is my first rear part um, that I've since replaced uh, because I made some changes to it. Um, our original motor that we were running, our Castle 1406 motor that we were running, all sorts of chassis parts. Original rally block tires. Um, some parts from the Volkswagen body as we were slowly uh, trimming the body down. Um, I just saved everything just kind of as a reminder. Um, this is our original steering servo that I ran. I stripped out the gears on this. I have since um, replaced those teeth so the servo is good to go again. Um, I don't know, just all sorts of bits and bobs. We got stripped gears. Actually, this is the only gear that I've stripped so far on the run. So a lot of these gears, some of them have a little bit extra wear that I, I would prefer not to run, but in an emergency, I will run it. We got the TLO one high speed gear for the rear. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't work in the front unless you machine off this, uh, this outer gear here. All sorts of goodies, a lot of printed parts. There's our original speed controller. Um, here's uh, the some additional gears for that servo, that Savox servo. Um, outdrive cups by Yeah Racing. Uh, these tend to get thrown when you break off a suspension arm or pop a rod end. Um, here's our rear uprights, which we've replaced with our own 3D printed version. Uh, what else? Carbon fiber bits. There's our front one of our front body mounts. Um, Rear shock tower, <laughs> all sorts of goodies. Arms, uprights, more arms, lots of arms. Front front bumper bracket. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and flip the camera out. I'm gonna do a deep dive on my uh, open class Tamiya MF01X chassis, and then we'll get into the speed run uh, for our week three entry. All right, so I guess first let's look at our steering knuckles. So this is the uh, this is obviously the MF01X steering knuckle, and then this is the TRF418. Um, um, so they're very close, both in the kind of the steering link arm length, as well as the offset from the pivot um, to the face uh, um, where the outer bearing mounts. So I'm running the TTO2 SRX uh, rear drive shafts on the front of my MF01X. I like these better than Yeah Racing CVDs because these are a better material. They're harder and stronger, less, less prone to bending. Whereas on the Yeah Racing ones, I have to re true those almost after every run. In order to get the um, these to fit, I had to grind away some material because the inner and outer bearing spacing is a little bit larger than on the TTO2. So I had to kind of remove a little bit of material from the inside um, to get the to allow the the out drive to come through enough so I could get the cross pin in. Um, also, in order to run the contact foams on these cars, um, you need a little bit of spacing, otherwise you'll rub up on your um, control link arm. And so to do that, you can either put washers between your wheel hex and the wheel, uh, but that doesn't provide very good support for your drive, your out drive, in which case you might, uh, you're, you're also prone to bending that out drive. So I'm running seven millimeter aluminum hex extensions. Um, I prefer the clamp style versus the set screw style. Um, I feel like it does a better job of centering uh, the wheel, which leads, uh, you know, miscentering can lead to vibration. So these are the Tamiya drive shafts. So the other thing I was doing on these is I was I had installed some three millimeter helicoil inserts uh, because I was pulling the threads on these and it was getting kind of sloppy. Um, usually when screws start stripping, I can go back and kind of uh, repair those threads with CA glue. 
Uh, I use like a medium CA glue to fill the hole and then I rerun the screw into it and usually you're good to go. But these are starting to get walled out so I, I still had enough material to install the helicoils which I did which gave me a nice uh, solid foundation for those pivots and that worked well up until uh, this crash which sheared off this. But there's nothing you can do about that that's going to happen when you're crashing at those speeds. So I am running a Gens Ace uh, lithium high volt uh, pack. It's a six, it's a 3S 6500 milliamp hour pack. This is what I ran my TTO2 on. Uh, I do like the hard shells. They set, tend to hold up better um, than the soft shells. The soft shells start kind of, they're almost like clay and they start kind of changing shape <laughs> as you crash the car, uh, I guess, which is to be expected. I wasn't running this earlier in the contest because I had a hard time getting it stuffed under the body, but I was able to make a couple of tweaks uh, to get that to fit. So with the body and the wing and this battery, the car is getting heavy, which is fine. I like the weight because it helps keep the car planted. Uh, but we're weighing in at 2.75 kilograms, which is about six pounds. Uh, that's pretty heavy for a RC car. But again, I like the weight. Um, I'm even adding weight. I'm running three ounces on the front nose of the car um, just to keep that front end down. You want your car heavy if you're going fast, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, obviously, there's a point where it becomes uh, problematic if your car is too heavy. Uh, but if you can get your car heavy and into a very compact form factor, so your front, with aerodynamics, you want to get your frontal area as small as possible. Uh, think of it as like a ram pushing uh, through the air. The bigger your frontal area is, you have to push that much air as you're going through it. Um, so if you have a small frontal area, um, you, it's much easier to push through the air than a large frontal area. That's actually one of the reasons I'm, I'm not going with the um, Mercedes C11 body, even though it's a great looking body. It looks like it would be perfect for a speed run car. It is much wider and bigger than the Ford uh, GT body. Um, so that Ford GT body is very compact. Um, and I think it has a much better uh, frontal area. Um, let's go ahead and pop the wheels off and we can kind of look a little bit closer at the car. We're going to start from the bottom and work our way up. So the pan. This is a carbon fiber pan. Um, this is the second version. Basically in the second version I wanted to get the tire cutouts closer to the tires so I had less airflow through the car. Um, and that's what I did. Um, I have these cutouts in the bottom of the pan for the chassis because the chassis is not flat. Um, it's kind of wedge shaped and these wedges poke up through the pan. Um, where it is flat are the 3D printed parts of my chassis. Um, so I intentionally created flat spots so I could mount the pan to. Um, and then in the back I have um, these little adapter blocks uh, in there which allow me to kind of tie the rear of the chassis uh, to the rest of the chassis. In the front I'm tied in through this uh, bracket here which bolts into the front bulkhead um, and then I can tie that into the pan as well. Um, I've kind of debated whether or not to cover up these cutouts. Again, you don't want to have airflow through the car, but um, my arrow is working for me. And because I don't really know what I'm doing, I'm just kind of doing it by trial by fire. I don't want to mess with things if they're working. Um, the wheel cutouts are kind of a no brainer, but I don't know. This might, maybe this helps me, <laughs> maybe it doesn't. I don't know. I suppose I could try to run where it's closed, but I don't want to run the risk of launching the car and having problems. In the front, we have this adapter piece as we talked about, which ties the front uh, gearbox to the pan. Uh, I'm running um, 3D printed front lower arms. So I got rid of the fixed plastic ones and I'm running the adjustable links here so I can set my camber. Um, I'm running the Rilarlo shocks because I feel like they're much stiffer than any of the shocks that are offered for the MFO1X cars or the TTO2 cars. Um, these are meant for a heavier car, which my car is heavy. so. Um, I like the Rolardo shocks because they're meant for a heavier car. So my front diff is locked um, with epoxy, so it's 100% lock. Uh, and then on the rear diff, I use the uh, silicone earplugs. I use three of them, um, so it's essentially locked, but I can still kind of force uh, the two wheels to spin a little bit if I, if I wanted to. So it's like a 95% lock um, on the rear. On the front, we've got our custom little body posts uh, with that Ford GT body. Um, it cut it drops down quite a bit in the front and then um, To get the body down to the level of the pan I basically had to do these custom body mounts and I wanted to use the existing body holes on that body um, Because they're already drilled So I have this kind of custom low profile Body mounts using the existing mounting points on the car and then to get these shocks to kind of fit under the body I had to drop them down uh, below the original mount points 
So one of the things that I love about having a pan is that it gives me the ability to adjust my ride height and uh, my wheel loading uh, on the car. And what I do is I, I, I put these set screw holes or grub screw holes into the arms which allows me to basically turn those and tweak the ride height. Those grub screws limit the down travel of the arm where if I advance those grub screws it'll basically raise the arm up and lower the front ride height. And same in the rear. And so what I do when I'm kind of tweaking it is I'll set my ride height and then I'll put this on. So I've got one of these systems here um, that uses four scales. Basically you put a scale under each wheel and then I go through and I look at the, the weighting on each wheel and I try to balance it so that all the wheels kind of see the same weight. I can do that by tweaking these screws on the arms and, and it usually takes like a, you know, it's very sensitive to where, you know, an eighth of a turn or even less is enough to get the car balanced. But um, that's kind of just one of the things I do to, to tune it before I go out for a run. For the servo arm, I... Um, I don't have a servo saver, it's, it's a direct connect and I basically took an aluminum servo arm and I made this carbon fiber adapter uh, so, I can, so that I could connect the two steering links uh, to the servo arm and I also pushed that lever arm out uh, towards the front of the car because I wanted to try to get as good geometry as possible where I'm trying to get those, I'm trying to get those links parallel with the front axle of the car. So we're to the point where we're, we're just barely rubbing by uh, the cutout in the chassis for your servo link. Um, and I suppose being an open class, if I wanted to, I could notch that out even more. Um, but I think uh, for now we're good. And then I've been using this nice little cutout for the GNS GPS because it fits perfectly thanks to a uh, Rob for pointing that out. And because I'm running a castle system, I'm running the Bluetooth link so that I can change the motor parameters um, kind of from my phone to make tweaks to the uh, ESC. So on the rear of the car, I'm running 3D printed lower arms and a 3D printed uh, uprights. I have swapped out the links on the rear for some actual tie rods uh, to improve the adjustment of camber. Um, for this body, uh, the body points want to be right here, which made it almost impossible to do something off the original mounting points. Uh, so I made this bracket that ties into my rear shock tower um, to mount that body. Also on this shock tower, uh, in one of my crashes, I had destroyed my um, rear gearbox mounting points. I kind of tore them out, so I added four additional screws for uh, tying the shock tower into the gearbox. I'm still running that busted gearbox, but uh, so far this has been holding up well with six screws holding a shock tower on. <laughs> it's a little excessive, but hey, uh, you do what you do, right? Let's see here. So because I'm running the uh, obviously the mid-motor conversion, where basically I took the motor out of the rear of the car and I moved it into the middle point and I'm driving, I'm powering the drivetrain from the prop shaft. So as I said before, I'm running the mod 0.8 gears. So my, my spur gear is a 32 tooth and then right now I'm running a 27 tooth on my um, pinion. Uh, I don't know what my final drive is, but it's pretty high. Uh, it's like it's in the twos somewhere. I just, I don't, I have to go back and look at my calculator. The advantage of this is that I can get much taller gearing and much beefier gearing. I eliminate the gear train to the front because I'm kind of in the middle of that gear train now, uh, which is, uh, I think, a more balanced uh, power delivery to the drivetrain, front and rear drivetrain. Um, on the rear, because we're not running a motor, I went ahead and made a block, block off plate for the motor to kind of close that up. On your out drives, uh, you want to get yourself some some five millimeter shims. That's five millimeter ID shims, and make sure you shim out any um, axial slop in these out drives. Um, and I've done that. Um, wherever there's slop, you want to try to eliminate if you can. Uh, it just makes for a more precise car. It eliminates uh, any uncertainty in how the car is behaving. Um, but you want to make sure you don't bind things up. Um, so it's kind of like you, you shim until things are, are, are not binding, but they're, they're, they're also not moving all over the place on you. As we can see with that mid-motor conversion, um, it's integrated into these custom 3D printed chassis pieces. Uh, we have extended the length of this chassis from 239 to uh, 259 to fit the TTO2 bodies. On the prop shaft, uh, the original prop shaft is a five millimeter uh, steel prop shaft. Uh, I have now, I am now running a six millimeter titanium prop shaft and then I machine it down to the five millimeters in the front and rear um, to adapt to those bevel gears and the bearings that support the ends. I'm going to go ahead and pull off the front uh, bevel gear cover. 
and we can look inside. Uh, one of the things that I do do between runs, because that prop shaft is turning so fast and everything's that grease gets thrown off of the gears, I, I go back and I re-grease the bevel gears after every run, or every outing I guess. Here is our front um, bevel gearbox. Uh, you can see the gear almost looks dry because all that grease has been thrown off. Um, the spacing between that bearing, the rear bearing, and the, the bevel gear is what sets your uh, gear mesh. And so you want to make sure that that spacing is dialed in so you have good mesh. Uh, I set it so that, I mean basically it's, it's a fill. Um, I set it with the gearbox off and I have a little um, gauge pin that I use as a, as a, a pseudo uh, prop shaft. And I, I basically shim it and adjust the shim stacks until this feels smooth and yet there's not, uh, there's very minimal slop. Then on the front, um, this bearing's kind of floating. Uh, what I do is I put a shim between the, the bevel gear and uh, the bearing so that if that bearing acts, you know, works itself backwards against the um, bevel gear, it's not rubbing on the plastic generating heat, that shim creates a gap between the bevel gear and the uh, bearing so that we're not heating up the plastic uh, gear. Um, and then I just let that uh, bearing kind of float. I like to believe that as you put on the gear cover, this gets clamped down. Um, so that it can't float too much, but with the vibration and the speeds of the drive shaft, things can kind of wander if they're allowed to. I use a little bit of tri-flow on the bearing, so before each run I'll put a drop of tri-flow on each bearing, and then I will use a grease on the gears. Yeah, lately I've been using this HPI heavy duty grease because this is what I have from my days with the HPI Baja. Uh, I don't have a lot of Tamiya grease at the moment, so I've got tons of tubes of this stuff which seems to work out well. And it's the same in the back, it's just kind of reversed. Uh, those shims are between the bevel gear and the front bearing, and not the rear bearing, and then the rear bearing is left to float. A lot of people ask what this is. Uh, this is just a LED light. <laughs> uh, I've seen people use these when they're doing night running. I, I don't have very good vision, so I, I start to lose the car when it's far away from me, so I throw the light on thinking it'll help, but usually by the time it's you know an eighth of a mile away, I can't see it anyways. Uh, so I don't know how much it helps. So the last thing to talk about is a servo. Because I'm not running a servo saver, I want something with metal gears that's fairly strong, and I want something that's fast, and I want something that has, for me the biggest thing is the dead bend. So the dead bend on a servo is basically the, the smallest increment that the servo will move, or the, the smallest increment of signal that you put into the servo before it sees that, okay, I need to move. I might not be explaining this accurately, but this is kind of how I envision it in my head. Um, so you want a low dead band steering, ser or steering servo. Uh, this servo, I measured it at about one microsecond where I put it on a servo tester and I could increment uh, the signal by one microsecond and see the servo move as I incremented it by one microsecond. If you move it, say, three or four microseconds, like on, that, on the 10 microsecond steering servo, if you move it three or four microseconds, the servo is not going to move. So basically you're putting in steering commands and the servo is not moving, but it's going to jump. And I think if you've got servos that have kind of these, these large dead bands, that, that can cause some string problems where your car is kind of wandering all over the road. Um, so looking for a servo that has metal gears, um, is fast, and has low dead bend. I would shoot for something between 3 and 1 microsecond dead bend. This servo here is a... I'm going to have to put the brand of the servo in the comments. I can't tell right off the bat. It's, it's kind of a, what I would call a no-name brand servo. It works. It's worked well. It's, it's held up to the crashes. I haven't had any um, issues with it. But let's go ahead and get into some of the radio settings of this car. In order to do that, I'm going to go ahead and install a battery uh, so that I can turn the car on. Um, and primarily what I want to look at uh, with this is the gyro setup. Uh, to kind of make sure that your gyro is set up properly. I think we can do it with one uh, steering knuckle because we're obviously missing the other side. So one thing is when I'm doing my speed runs, I have dual rates set up on my steering on the radio so that in the speed run I have very limited throw on my steering. Um, I don't know what I'm set at. I think it's like on the order. And then when I'm maneuvering to kind of get set up for the run, I've got a little more... Basically my endpoints are set up so that my tires don't rub on the um, my pan. So when you've got your gyro set up, um, and I have control on my radio so that I can adjust the rate of my gyro, and I'll go ahead and turn it up just so we can see it for the video. Um, 
but it gets a little uh, unstable, obviously. So the gyro corrects uh, missteer, right? So if your car turns to the right, you want your gyro to turn the steering servo to the left. And if you turn to the left, if your car turns to the left or wanders to the left, you want your gyro to correct in the right direction. So that's that has to do with the sign of your gyro, uh, making sure that it's correcting in the right direction. If it corrects in the wrong direction, it'll actually it becomes unstable and it basically throws you off. Um, you would know that immediately uh, because you wouldn't be able to drive the car. So the other thing you want to do is control the gain of your gyro. The gyro built in these radios, actually most gyros have adjustable gain. Uh, on this receiver it's built in and I think its default is on channel 3. Uh, with the external gyros they usually have an extra servo lead for gain adjustment. So right now the gain's turned up pretty high. So the car has a natural response for steering and if your gyro gain is too high what happens is you overshoot. And what that presents itself as is the car starts to wobble. So you start going straight, then you see these wobbles as the car is going. That wobble is a dead giveaway that your gain is turned up way too high. So all you have to do is turn that gain down and just keep turning it down until as you go in a straight line those wobbles go away and the car starts tracking in a straight line. Uh, but if your gain is turned up too high, uh, you get wobbles. Um, but all that means is you just got to turn your gain down. It's, it's a super simple uh, <laughs> relationship to understand. So obviously this radio, the settings are very specific to this radio, but I'm going to try to describe the different settings that you want in your car. Um, this channel 8 is actually my um, gyro gain. I said channel 3, but I've linked it to channel 8 somehow. Um, this radio is not very intuitive as far as the settings go. so. You, you definitely need to keep the manual with you on this um, because they kind of label things differently than what we're used to with like the Futabas um, if you grew up on Futabas. <laughs> like I grew up calling things dual rates but uh, they're not called dual rates in this radio. Um, so my gain is usually around here on that gyro. Another thing I like about this radio is it shows you your servo outputs. Um, so even though you know this stuff's kind of um, it's hard to visualize on the car but if I can visualize my servo outputs on the radio, then it, it kind of helps inform how things are set up. So here I have my gain for my gyro. So on my steering, which is channel one, I, I dialed back my endpoints so that I don't rub the pan. Um, so that's basically full steering travel. And then on my dual rate, when I dial it back, that's my steering travel. So you can see how much uh, dialed back that is. The other thing I want to show you is throttle. Um, so I've got a lot of programming built into my throttle now, thanks to Charles. I've got my throttle and my braking. So my braking, I've got ABS set up, and here I can see that braking kind of pumping. Um, and this, the ABS braking is built in the radio settings, and so when I, when I push the brake, it basically pumps the brake like an ABS system. So on throttle, I, I tried to do, I guess, what you would consider a fixed acceleration where Regardless of how, how fast you pull that, that trigger, it, it has a very slow ramp up on throttle. And this gives Instead you, of trying to feather the throttle with your finger, um, the, th the feathering is done in the radio where it limits how fast it's changing that throttle. So I'm, when, I, when you see it kind of ramp up like that, I'm, just, I'm instantly pulling, the, you know, I'm pulling that down. You see how slow that ramps up. That was, Charles and I were talking last night about that, and that's a really cool feature that I, I didn't even know existed. <laughs> so, yeah. And that, I, I saw that today when I was running, it was just a super smooth ramp up on acceleration. Um, that'll save your gears, so you know, if you accidentally blip the throttle, you run the risk of burning up your gears, having this nice little ramp up. So the nice thing about this radio is it has multiple points where along the range of that throttle um, input, you can set how fast it ramps up. Um, so like in the beginning, I've got full ramp, and then beyond that, I think it's like 30%, it's super slow, uh, just so I have that nice gradual, um, constant acceleration of the vehicle. Then the next step you want to do is you want to make sure your channels are in the right direction. You want to make sure your steering is correct and your throttle is correct. Um, the throttle actually I don't mess with. If I need to reverse throttle I will do it in the uh, speed controller, um, not on the radio. What else? Endpoints. So then you want to set your endpoints on your steering. Don't mess with the throttle. The throttle um, you should actually, you need to calibrate your speed controller to your throttle um, and that's usually one of the first steps when you install a new speed controller is calibrating it to your throttle input. Um, on the steering you want to set your endpoints so that your, your wheels aren't hitting parts of your chassis or you're not um, locked up on your steering. So basically when you first set up a radio your endpoints, your travels are probably going to be too high. 
um, where you need to dial them back so that you're not binding up your steering because you run the risk of breaking something and also burning up your servo if you don't set your endpoints properly. Sub trim, uh, so this is basically to kind of dial in your steering. So, you know, when you first set it up mechanically, your steering is not going to be perfect. So the sub trim allows you to kind of dial in uh, that steering um, prior to your regular trim. So you have kind of main trim and you have sub trim and they, they typically are different. Though I've seen some radios where they, that are basically the same thing, but um, I guess on some radio, um, what I grew up on, the sub trim was different than your, your main trim. These receivers are capable of telemetry. So if I wanted to monitor my car's battery voltage, they, it comes with a kind of a, a feedback into the receiver and it splices in line with your battery connector to determine what the voltage is on your battery and then I can read back that voltage to my radio. Steering curves, okay, so here we go. Every radio is gonna have steering curves. You want your steering, uh, you wanna add some exponential in your steering so that uh, kind of in the middle here, you can see that red vertical line moves as I input on the steering. In the middle you want it to be somewhat flat so that small inputs equal small output. So your input is the uh, horizontal line and your output is the vertical line. So the flatter that is, um, the smaller your output is going to be at your steering. So you can imagine if you're going in a straight line, uh, you don't want to have a very responsive system because you want to kind of be able to put small inputs without, without having the car veer off real fast. And so I throw in a minus 60% expo. It's, it might be higher than what other people's like, but, uh, but I, I've grown comfortable with it. But you always want to run some kind of exponential in steering, uh, just so kind of your straight line handling is, is fairly stable, regardless of how crude your input is <laughs> into it. That constant acceleration is actually called throttle delay. Um, and here you can kind of see the green zone is, uh, it's, it's basically, my first point is at 20%. Um, and that's a green zone, which is at a uh, hundred percent. And then as I get in from 20 to hundred percent, it, it ramps down to 18% or 18. I don't know what the values actually mean. Um, but the lower this number, the slower that, uh, that ramp up is on the throttle. So if I were to turn this down to like one, it would be uh, super slow. <laughs> but that is throttle delay uh, which is a super cool feature and there's our ABS brakes I guess you can have multiple ABS brake setups we're just running one um, and I don't have a, I can have a switch to trigger it um, uh, on or off I just keep it on all the time brake channel 2 brake return 50% so basically it goes so regardless of where your brake is the the letting off of the brake is at 50% there's a lot of settings in here that I'm not. You have your inner, your cycle speed. Um, I think the, the higher this number is, the slower it is. So the lower the number, the faster it is. Again, this is where you want to read the manual to better understand this rate. This is something you can kind of tweak with, uh, but you should try to set up ABS brakes to help with your stopping so that you don't uh, lose control when you're slowing down. And a lot of this stuff, for, there's some nitro stuff, there's mixing, gyro mixing, four wheel steering mixing, um, tank mixing. So there's a lot of cool stuff, but none of that applies to speed run cars. All right, so that's all I've got on our radio setup, as well as the deep dive on the MFO1X uh, open class speed run car. If you have any questions or suggestions, please let us know down below in the comments. Uh, otherwise, thanks for tuning in and watching. I'll catch you on the flip side. Bye. Alright, so we're all set up, ready to go. Let's see what we can do. Alright.
Huh. It seemed to be a <laughs> missing a wheel there. <laughs> All right. Just probably try to find that. We broke 100 miles an hour. We could definitely do better though. This uh, this doesn't help. <laughs> you go fast when you start throwing parts off the car. Because um, those, the car felt good. Um, got some new things we're trying out. All right, so new T PB. We almost gained 10 miles an hour and we broke the 100 mile an hour mark. We're there, uh, but we just need to do it better. Cool. <laughs> let's uh let's go ahead and check our records make sure they're valid so that record is valid 104 miles an hour we are there <laughs> okay let's uh do it Go ahead and uh, look at the car, see where we're at. And the car is solid now. It's just a matter of getting good runs and not hitting stuff on the road. Um, made a bunch of changes to, thanks to Charles again, I was talking to him late, at night, late last night, um, working out some radio settings to help with uh, acceleration. Um, So that helped out. Um, in the last run, the 95 mile an hour run, I um, stripped out some gears and uh, on the prop shaft they have these little plastic spacers for the bearings and the, the bevel gear and that sets the pitch of the bevel gear. Well my spacer had melted and so it threw off the pitch of that gear and it basically stripped that gear out. Um, so I got rid of the plastic spacers and I put in some metal shims. And in doing so, I also was able to shim the gear exactly how I wanted it, so I had the perfect mesh. Um, so that worked out, assuming it worked out. Um, and just little things, I basically went over the car, kind of... Every, I basically rebuilt the whole car from scratch. I took it apart, replaced the gears, greased up the gears, replaced bearings. Um, got everything dialed back in to where it should be. I do that almost after every run. Uh, well, because the runs end in a crash, I, I, I should say I do that after almost every crash. Oh, look at all that debris in there. Oh, we lost some wheel weights. Uh, there's two wheel weights that belong there. Um, one of the other things I've been doing um, on these little red steering knuckles, I put thread inserts in here, um, some helicoils, and obviously those got torn out. Um, when you hit those little bumps at 100 miles an hour, oh wow, we popped, oh, that's why the motor wasn't running. We popped a motor plug. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. We had enough force to pull that motor plug out. Uh-oh, we lost one of those outdrives. That's unfortunate. What else do we lose? All right, so here's our setup. We got our, we're running this uh, new battery. It's not a new battery. This is the battery we ran from our TTO2. I just was struggling to get it to stuff inside the body. Um, so I had to make some tweaks. Uh, but there's our plug. It's a 3S pack, 6,500 milliamp hour, high voltage, 11.4. Um, otherwise, not too bad. 